Hello and welcome to this audio service by the Rosendale Methodist Circuit. What you'll hear shortly is a recording of a service that usually takes place at Longhome Methodist Church in Rottenstall on Tuesday mornings at 10am. This is a live recording, so do expect some background noise, although we've tried to reduce this as much as we can. The hymns, unfortunately, have to be removed for copyright reasons, but we've suggested some links to versions of the hymns below this video. Well, good morning. Good morning. morning. Our first Tuesday in Lent. And we're going to begin with some words from the book of Job, no less. The story of Job, as you know, is an attempt to answer the question of suffering. Why do the good suffer? You know, uh, so if you want to try and understand something of that it's always a good study to do the book of Job and all the way through Job well to begin with you find out about how you know he was a wonderful guy he uh, lovely family great wealth and uh, God says to Satan have you seen my servant Job you know what a wonderful person and Satan says well if you took away all this stuff you know he would soon turn against you and so bit by bit Job loses his herds, his wealth, his family, and uh, ends up sitting on the local rubbish heap, scraping his sores with bits of broken pottery, and the dog's licking his sores. And then three friends come along to sit with him for a while in silence, which is the best thing they could have done, because once they opened their mouths, it all went wrong. (laughs) Basically, they were saying, Job, you must be a sinner. God punishes sinners. And Job's saying, look, I've done all the things I should have done. But in the end, after all the questions and all the conversations, God answers Job. Right, in in chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And this is what God said. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no further and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all of this. And it goes on and on, God challenging Job. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? Has the reign a father, God asks him. And in the end, of course, Job says, no. Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. Then God challenges him again and again. And then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. 
Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Which is perfect for Lent. But that recognition of who he is before the awesomeness of God. Interesting words that William Cowper has written there. Trying to understand something of God's way of working. Which Job struggled to do. And I think we all do at different times. More of that in a moment. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God of mystery and that there is so much that we do not understand. That means you're so great and wonderful and there's always more to discover. And it's such an adventure as we discover more and more of you. And as you reveal more and more of yourself to us in and through Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we thank you and praise you and bow down and worship you. And Lord God, we, we ask for your forgiveness for those times when we've forgotten just how great you are. We've become so engrossed in the smallness of our lives that we've failed to see how awesome your nature is just how wonderful your love for us is and Lord as the Bible tells us you know, we are here but just a short space of time and yet you are for all eternity help us to keep things in perspective we pray So that as we turn our eyes on you, we might grow in faith and trust and understand a little bit more of all that you have done for us and how much you love us. We thank you that even though we so often turn away from you, you keep on calling us back to yourself. And so we thank you for that gift of forgiveness once again. You are such a merciful and loving God. And we pray now, come Holy Spirit. Come and fill us once again that the thoughts and word, the thoughts of our hearts and minds, the words of our mouths might be acceptable to you. And that our lives each day might bring glory to you. And after we are finished here this morning, that we might continue to worship through all that we do and say today. And in all things, bring glory to you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here's a, a little challenge for you this morning. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to stand on your head or run around the room or anything. I just want you to think of someone you know very well. Someone you know very well. Okay. How well do you know them? What can you tell me about them? What's the colour of their eyes? Ooh, a few puzzled looks. <laughs> How do they react to pressure and stress? Very well. Well, that's always good to know. That's good to know, yeah. yeah. It might be a close friend that you're thinking of. It might be a, a brother, sister. It might be a husband, wife, partner. But just how well do you know their heart? You don't, Not really? really. No? no? We were all private people. And we are, aren't we? Yeah, there are things we, we guard. There are things we guard. There are things that we want to keep to ourselves. There's um, this book by Dane Ortland called Gentle and Lowly. It's a book I'm, I'm using for uh, our Lent groups. So you're getting first uh, first look at it this morning. 
And he, he tells this, uh, something he's made up, I'm sure. But he writes this, he says, A wife may tell you much about her husband, his height, his eye colour, his eating habits, his education, job, his handiness around the house, his best friend, his hobbies, even his Myers-Briggs personality profile. <laughs> Jackie can tell you mine. Can you believe that? My Myers-Briggs profile. Anyway, um, his favourite sports team. But what can she say to communicate his knowing gaze across the table over a dinner at their favourite restaurant? Oh, it's nice, isn't it? That look that reflects years of ever-deepening friendship, thousands of conversations and arguments through which they have safely come, a time ripened settling into the assurance of embrace, come what may. That glance that speaks in a moment of his loving protection more clearly than a thousand words. In short, what can she say to communicate to another her husband's heart for her? There are some people we know far better than anyone else, aren't there? But even so, we might not know everything about them. Well, Sometimes you think you know. And then you don't. And then you get a huge yeah. shock. Right, yeah. It could be the other way, yeah. You, so they do something and it really surprises you and it's really nice, yes. Well, here's how God knows you. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. And further on in Psalm 139, I praise you, oh, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! God knows us in such an intimate way. He knows everything about us. How well do you know God? Now there's a question. How well do you know God? I'm sure that you could tell me lots about him. About what he's done down through the millennia. Through the, through the words of the Bible. Beginning with Adam and Eve right back there in Genesis. Or even before that with the creation of the, the cosmos. What he did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and for Moses and the people of Israel all the way through those pages of the Bible. But do we know his thoughts? Do we know God's heart? In Isaiah chapter 55, it says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is mighty, God is mysterious. Hence that first hymn, God moves in a mysterious way. So I wonder, if he had one, what gets God out of bed in the morning? Does God go to bed? Well, I, that's what I'm saying, if he had one, yes, if he had a bed. <laughs> what motivates him? What gets him up and going and think, thinking, oh, I've got to do this today, I must do this. Maybe, maybe that, it's a question that's a bit too far, that it sort of blows your mind a little bit, you know, what is God like, how well do we know God? So let's try a different approach. What gets Jesus out of bed in the morning? Well, it's still God, but it's easier to imagine, isn't it, with Jesus, and to think about. See, how well do we know Jesus? How well do we know him? And again, I'm sure that we could 
talk a lot about what Jesus did when he was walking the highways and byways of Galilee and Palestine. You know, from his birth right through to his ascension, with all the details of his teaching, his crucifixion and his death and resurrection, you, we could talk all about that and we could explain it all. We could maybe even say about something about how his death uh, and his resurrection overcame the powers of sin and death. You know, so we could talk a little bit about what that means. What it means in terms of how we have eternal life. We could try and understand how Jesus' self-sacrifice works in, in cleansing us from our sin so that we can inherit eternal life. You, know, you could go down to the university libraries, we well, probably do it online now, can't you? And read book after book after book after book after book. And I used to look at these lines of books when I was studying for my degree on the university shelves and think, goodness me, do I have to read all those? You know, thankfully, most of them you could just dip into because there's only a little bit, a chapter here, a chapter there and things. But all about the work of Jesus Christ, all about what he'd done. But there's not a lot on who Jesus is. What is the heart of Jesus Christ? The thing is, Jesus wants us to know him. And someone says, you know, you can read all the books about Jesus, you can write, you can sort of write essays about him, you can say your prayers, you can go on retreat, you can do all these things, but you not necessarily know Jesus himself. You know, I studied with people who just studied theology because they were interested. They didn't have a faith. In no way did they know Jesus. So do you know Jesus? Do you know his heart? And do you know his heart for you? Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. Jesus has just been um, told about John the Baptist. Uh, he's had messengers come from John the Baptist who's in prison. And... Um, John was asking, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another? Down in the depths of a Roman prison, he was obviously losing a bit of heart himself. You know, and he wanted to know if Jesus really was the one. And Jesus sends the messengers back, telling them that you know, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offence at me. So Jesus sends these messengers from John the Baptist back to him to say, yes, I am the one. You know, I'm fulfilling all the, all the prophecies about who the Messiah would be. And then John praises uh, John the Baptist to, to the crowds that have gathered. And that's, and that's quite a long little passage there that is important. But we're not going to look at that this morning. And then Jesus talks about some of the cities that he's visited and how they've not repented and come back to God as he's gone through them. So he's, he said, woe to these towns of Capernaum and, and places like that. And then we read this. At that time, so all of this has been going on, and then it says, then Matthew tells us, at that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Father knows the Son, the Son knows the Father, and those who Jesus chooses to reveal, sorry, those the Father, no, let me get this right way around. Those the Son chooses to reveal the Father to, they also will know the Father and the Son. This is what Jesus wants, he and the Father want. They want us to know them. They want us to know what is in their very heart. And then Jesus goes on and says, Come to me, all you that are weary, and are carrying heavy burdens, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And if you do this, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am gentle and lowly in heart. It's only here in the whole of the New Testament that Jesus opens up his heart to us and tells us all about who he is deep down. I am gentle and lowly in heart. But before we explore what we understand by gentle and lowly, we need to understand how the, how the Bible uses the word heart. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago today in fact, it was Valentine's Day. Flowers, chocolates, cards, meals, and of course, hearts. It's all right shaking your head. <laughs> No cards, flowers, no, oh dear. No romance. Well, yeah, a little bit maybe, yeah. But, <laughs> but it's, that's how we understand the heart, isn't it, today, in 21st century Britain. People talk about, oh, I love you with all my heart. Yes. Well, they don't actually mean you. They don't actually mean, do they, that I love you with this pump that's pumping blood around my body. Yeah? that's got four cat, cat, you know, whatever they are, four, what are they called? Ventricles, yeah, thank you, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's not what we mean, we understand that. that. But that's not what the Bible means either. In Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, Solomon writes this, above all else, guard your heart from, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart, everything. So the heart is much, much more than how we understand it in our sort of culture. See, the Bible doesn't just use the word heart to describe emotions. The heart is the center of our being in the Bible. It's the central animating center of all that we do. It's the center of who we are. So when you read the word heart in the Bible, it's the center of who we are. And it's the heart that gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. It's our motivating headquarters, if you like. It defines and it directs us. And that's why Solomon wrote, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. In another translation, it says this, keep the heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. How's that? That's a lovely translation, isn't it? From the heart flows the springs of life. So our heart, when you read about your heart in the Bible, somebody's heart, it's what makes us who we are. It drives everything we do, it is who we are. The heart is what gets us out of bed in the morning. And when Jesus tells us that his heart is gentle and lowly, that this is who he is, does it not make you wonder at such a wonderful saviour? That he is gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly in heart. What does that mean? To say he's gentle and lowly. Well we've got another five weeks to explore that. <laughs> gentle and lowly. Let me just give you a little bit of a taster. Since we've got a few minutes. The word gentle appears in the New Testament only four times. In chapter five of, and um, verse five of Matthew's gospel, it says, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, which is the other way of translating gentle. Blessed are the meek. And also then in, in Matthew 21, Zechariah, a quote from the Zechariah, when Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus the king is coming to you humble and riding on a donkey. So gentle can mean meek and humble. And in 1 Peter, <coughs> we're told to have a gentle and quiet spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit. So we've got meek, humble and gentle. Meek, humble and gentle. Three different ways of translating the same word. 
and lowly, of course, um, lowly riding on a donkey, is uh, translated humble as well in James. But when you translate it humble, when you translate it humble, it's not necessarily the sense of um, being sort of humbling yourself here. It's where when Mary you know, has the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, and she says about how God will lift up the humble, those who are destitute, those you don't want to sit next to on the bus, you know, those who are, yeah, the people who will be pushed out to the edges of society. These are the ones that he's talking about. These are the humble. Romans 12 tells us, <clears throat> don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly, the socially unimpressive. You know, do not be haughty. Associate with the lowly. So, I am gentle, meek, humble, and lowly. And it's so important to remember that. And what I guess I say, one of the wonderful things about the fact that Jesus is lowly is that, you know, when we sometimes think about Jesus and we have these images, these pictures of, you know, he's high and mighty and lifted up and that's wonderful. But as he walked the highways and byways of Galilee and Palestine and the rest and Judea, he was never above anybody, was he? He would always reach out to those on the edge, always reach out to those who were in desperate need. So he would touch the leper. He would respond to Bartimaeus who cried out, have mercy on me. He would respond to those who were like the woman at the well, you know, who was all alone. And yet he brought her back into the community through the way that he spoke to her and gave her time. So to be gentle and lowly in heart is something we're going to explore. And it's that that gets Jesus out of bed, if you like. That's his heart for you and for me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. And as we explore what that means and what it means in terms of his love for us, we pray that you would enable us to get to know him better that our day-to-day -day relationship with him will deepen, will be nourished, and will just grow in such a wonderful way that our relationship will just grow stronger day by day. So Father, we thank you. For those who have written about these things, have studied these things, have enabled us to understand something of it, but more than that, we thank you that Jesus himself says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the service. You can find us online on www.rosendalemethodistcircuit.co.uk and also on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Please do let us know what you thought of this service in the comments below and you can always contact us by email at rosendalemethodistcircuit at gmail.com.